highest. Good morning and welcome to worship as we begin our journey into Holy Week. I'm so glad that each of you is here today, whether you're here in the sanctuary or whether you're joining us online, because whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever your skin color or income level or gender identity, whomever you love, whatever your faith or your doubts, we welcome all whom God welcomes. And friends, that means you. And now let's center our hearts and minds for worship. Join me in the time of confession. Today, as the crowds sing their praises, Peter fades from view, unnamed except as one of the disciples who did not understand what was happening. We too are prone to confusion about who Jesus is and how we are called to follow. Yet scripture promises that God is patient and kind, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Trusting in that patient love 
Let us confess our sins. Loving God, forgive us for our confusion when your revelations subvert our expectations. Forgive us for our stubbornness, insisting on triumph when Jesus calls us for sacrifice. Forgive us our cowardice when we hide from the following Jesus' way of self-giving. Forgive us and help us to go where you are leading, even when we can't fully see the path ahead. Amen. Children of God, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Take a moment to offer signs of peace to those around you. I'd like to invite the children to come forward. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Good. Tell me something. When you when I say the word king or queen, what do you think about? What do you think about? Like Queen Elizabeth, yeah? What else? King Charles, yeah, we think about specific monarchs. What else? What kinds of people or clothes or way they act or what they do? A king-sized bed, <laughs> also that, yes. They rule the country, they do, what else? Yeah? Yeah. Anything else? They're royal. And what does it mean when we talk about royalty? What's that, what does royalty look like? Yeah. So they wear crowns, they have fancy clothes, right? Well, so why do you think I'm asking you about kings and queens today? Anybody know? Why? Yeah.
Yes, we do pray for people, those in heaven and those here with us. That's right. And there have been a lot of people who have been kings and queens, and we pray for them, just like we pray for everybody else. We also talk about kings and royalty and what it means to be a king today because it's Palm Sunday. What happened on Palm Sunday? Why do we wave these palm branches? Do you know? Why? Kind of. That is what they originally did, right? We wave them today to remember the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem and all of the people were doing exactly what you said. The people saw him coming in and they said, he's the Messiah, he's the king. We're going to take off our cloaks and lay them on the ground. We're going to wave these palm branches. We're going to have a big parade because that's what you do for kings, right? But then, you know what's going to happen this week is that they're going to realize that while Jesus is king, Jesus is not an earthly king. And Jesus' kingship looks different. Which is why he comes riding in on a what? On a big war horse? No. no. A on a donkey, right? He comes in riding on a donkey. And he comes in not in fine clothes, but he comes in to save us all, to really save us. Not in the way that kings and queens talk about saving us but in the way that God means to save us and make us all in relationship with God. Yes, ma'am. God, we walk on God's foot. We walk on God's feet? I love that idea. We also walk on, we also walk on our hands. Yeah, cool. Will you pray with me? Holy One, we give you thanks for being a true king, a king that doesn't look like kings in this world, but a king who is truly concerned for all of us and all of our well-being. Help us to keep our eyes out for ways to celebrate your love this week and in the weeks to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, you can go upstairs. God, by your spirit, tell us what we need to hear and show us how we are to follow as disciples of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, the first reading is from John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Our second reading picks up where our first reading ended. Continue now to listen to the word of God. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we've been following all these different stories about Peter throughout Lent. And up until today's reading, Peter has been in the center of the action. He's the disciple who's always out in front of the others, always ready with his hand raised to blurt out the answer, whether it's the right answer or not, always the first with a proclamation of faithfulness. But suddenly, today, he's silent. In fact, he's so silent that he just drifts into the background of this story. He isn't even named separately. Today, amid all the noise and drama of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, Peter pulls back into the rank of the disciples, who, the gospel writer tells us, did not understand these things. And how could they? What they're seeing is a mismatch of messages that just doesn't fit with their expectations of the moment. All along, they have been primed for triumph. Yes, Jesus has kept talking about his inevitable suffering and death, but they've been able to push those words aside because of his actions. Turning water into wine, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, turning a couple of loaves and a few fishes into a feast for 5,000, raising the dead, talking back to the authorities with no apparent consequences, and always, everywhere he goes, drawing crowds by the multitudes. And now, this is the big moment. This grand entrance into Jerusalem, this moment where it seems like Jesus is poised to take the city, the center of power, both religious and political. And yes, the crowds are cheering. And yes, they're waving their palm branches. And yes, the authorities are visibly nervous. The Pharisees wring their hands. You see, you can do nothing. The world has gone after him. But still, something's not quite right. Something's off. What's off is Jesus, his demeanor, his self-presentation. The other participants don't seem to pick up on this in their jubilant frenzy, but the disciples who know Jesus best can't help but spot it. The triumphant Messiah they've been following has turned up to his victory parade, not on a horse, 
not even on a donkey, but on the colt of a donkey. You can almost imagine him, a grown man straddling this shrimpy animal, his toes dragging in the dirt. Now, just by way of contrast, Caesar, whenever he was making a triumphant entrance, always rode a horse, and not just any horse, but the grandest horse at his disposal. When the first of the Caesars, Julius, crossed the Rubicon, he was on his favorite steed. One website notes that not only was he a skilled horseman, but that he, quote, understood the visual power of a horse. The emperors of Rome, that center of world domination, always made sure they were mounted to impress because they understood the power of political theater. So did Jesus. Only there was something about the way he was seizing this particular moment that suggested his genre of political theater wasn't epic drama, but satire. He wasn't there to claim the throne of power, but to show how precarious that kind of throne always is. It may look grand, it may look stately, but it can be threatened by the chance of a lowly crowd and toppled by the actions of an itinerant preacher from nowhere. Jesus wasn't seizing domination. He was mocking the very concept of domination. Sir, we would see Jesus, some Greeks say to Philip. They are eager to latch onto the coattails of this ascendant Messiah who has the powers of religion and empire trembling. But when Philip tries to make that connection with Jesus, Jesus brushes them off. You won't get that power through me, he seems to say, because those who try to save their life will lose it, and those who give their life will keep it for eternity. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor, but it's not the kind of honor you're looking for. Well, that's the last we hear from those Greeks. And who can blame them? After all, much as we quote Jesus, aren't we all, at some level, trying to save our lives? And aren't we all, at some level, longing for the very kind of power he rejected? The kind of power that sure seems to be the only way to change the world? Several months ago, the New Republic carried an article titled, Evangelicals Call Jesus Liberal and Weak. The article cites an NPR interview with Russell Moore, who is an evangelical Christian and the editor-in-chief of Christianity Today. In that interview, Moore told NPR that, quote, multiple pastors had told him they would quote the Sermon on the Mount specifically the part that says to turn the other cheek, and someone would come up after the service and ask, where did you get those liberal talking points? What was alarming to me, Moore went on, is that in most of these scenarios, when the pastor would say, I'm literally quoting Jesus Christ, the response would not be, I apologize. The response would be, Yes, but that doesn't work anymore. That's weak. Moore said, when Christians get to the point where the teachings of Jesus himself are seen as subversive to us, then we're in a crisis. Here on this day that he thought would be so triumphant, Peter is in a crisis. 
that crisis will continue through the upcoming events of Holy Week. It will continue through the Last Supper, through Jesus' arrest and trial and crucifixion, and through the long days when Jesus will be lying dead and sealed within a tomb. The crisis really won't resolve itself for Peter and for the other disciples until after they've seen Jesus risen from the dead. Then, John tells us, they will remember that all these events of these days were foretold by Scripture, and they will finally understand. But this isn't then. This is now. All they can see now is the power of the temple priests, the power of the empire, the power of everything they had thought they were going to get to overthrow. They are troubled. But aren't we also troubled? Aren't we also in a crisis? When Karl Martin first sent me the link to that article about evangelicals calling Jesus liberal and weak, my knee-jerk reaction was righteous indignation. Well, how can they even call themselves Christians if they openly reject the teachings of Jesus and say they don't work? And then my finger started to turn back toward me. Wouldn't I, too, prefer something other than what Jesus gives us? Wouldn't I, too, like him to storm in and seize power and cast out those who cause such harm in this world? I would. I truly would. My head might nod along with turn the other cheek or The one who tries to save their life will lose it, but the one who gives their life for my sake will gain it. In my secret heart, though, or perhaps not so secret now, I look around at the world and think, that just doesn't work. Until I remember Jesus on that undersized donkey, mocking all the powers that be, much like Charlie Chaplin dressed up as the little general thumbing his nose at Hitler. If Jesus' way weren't truly a threat to empire, they wouldn't have felt the need to kill him. And when it came right down to it, killing Jesus didn't work. So it was their way that was weak. Is their way stronger now? Does violence and domination work now? Well, did Hamas's horrendous acts of atrocity work? Did it gain power for them or for the Palestinian people? Has Israel's vicious and relentless acts of retaliation against Gaza worked? Has it brought them back, the hostages, or given their nation a more secure position on the world stage? Did our nation's war on terror work? Do we all feel safer now? How is it that we never hold the ways of violence and domination to the same standard of proof that we hold Jesus' way. Maybe it's because we keep forgetting where his way is leading. What we see on this Palm Sunday is that Jesus' way is never leading toward world domination. It's leading toward world salvation. And you cannot save someone by destroying them. Peter and the disciples won't understand this 
until after Jesus is risen. But though Easter is still a week away, we are post-resurrection disciples. It's still okay to get confused and angered and grief-stricken by the state of this world. At least I sure hope it is. And it's still okay, required even, for us to want something different for this world. But we won't get something different by doing more of the same. When we forget that, we can look toward Jesus. There he is making a laughing stock of all the puffed up powers of this world who think they're in control. There he is showing us a better way. A slower way, yes, and a harder way, but a surer way. Because when they think they've won, he will rise up laughing, taking the whole world into his joy. And that is an ending to which it's worth giving our lives. Amen. Join me in the affirmation of faith from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not require God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess to the glory of God. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, will you pray with me? This week we remember the mystery and wonder of our faith, God. As we journey with you to Jerusalem, today our hearts overflow with songs of praise. Hosanna, we cry with the crowds. Blessed are you who comes in God's name. Yet we must admit that we are puzzled by you, by your suffering love that is more powerful than our brokenness, by your freely chosen humility 
that brings blessing to even our weariest places. By your forgiveness that summons us beyond ourselves and opens our eyes to the needs of our neighbors. And so we pray for this world that you so dearly love, for all of the people in it, for those who lay down their lives in service to others, for those who struggle to lead in these strange days, for all in the world in need of your healing presence, for those who are sick, afraid, or alone, for those who await news of loved ones in the hospital, for those who are grieving. We pray, especially this day, for those in our own community who need your presence. For Catherine and her family as they grieve Mike's death. For Brenda, Carolyn, and Pat. For Deborah, Bennett, Julia, and Dottie. For Michael, Charlotte. For Kathy's dad. For Bess. For Francis, James, and Jim. Jan, Al, and Sherry. Margaret and Rod, for all those in nursing homes and those caring for aging or ill loved ones. Sustain them on their journeys, God. We lift these dear ones and all those whose needs and names lie too close to our hearts to name aloud to you, Jesus, trusting that you know their needs before we can even name them. Strengthen us. And restore us that we might know and trust you deeply, living out your love in all aspects of our lives for the sake of our Savior, Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As Jesus entered Holy Week, he drew his disciples closer to him, I invite you to draw closely into the life of this church over this next week and beyond. This Thursday is Maundy Thursday when we remember Jesus' Last Supper. We will gather at 6 o'clock this Thursday in the chapel for a communion service, a simple remembrance of that time with his disciples before his arrest. And then on Friday, which is Good Friday, We will have prayer stations here through the sanctuary. Uh, It will be a self-guided journey through the stations of Peter, pondering how we too are prone to leave the God we love. The sanctuary will be open 12 to 2 and 5 to 7 p.m. Um, So just stop by whenever you have time to go through those stations. And then next Sunday, a week from today, is Easter. We'll begin the day with a potluck brunch at 9.30 in the morning, so bring something to share as we begin our celebration together. Uh, We'll have worship at 11 a.m., followed by an Easter egg hunt in the courtyard. I want to call your attention to a couple of pieces of literature in your bulletin. Um, If you would like to add to the beauty of the sanctuary for Easter, please uh, contribute a hydrangea. Uh, You can do this in in memory or in honor of someone that you care about, and it will make our celebration that much more beautiful. And then also, this week and next, we are receiving the One Great Hour of Sharing offering. That's what this one uh, refers to. One Great Hour of Sharing is an offering that we and our fellow Presbyterians take up every year on Easter, And it goes to three different things. It goes to help support disaster relief. And Presbyterians are particularly strong in long-term disaster relief. Long after other groups have left the scene, we stay with people, helping them to rebuild over the long haul. So the disaster relief, Presbyterian hunger program, 
So you're helping to support food pantries and community kitchens and community gardens. And then self-development of people, which supports groups of people who have been marginalized, who are leading their own groups in changing things for themselves. So I hope that you will give generously. If you want your offering to go to one great hour of sharing, please just note that in the memo. You can just say O-G-H-S, and we'll know what you mean. Over the last few weeks, we have been hearing from our various teams as we move toward our stewardship campaign. And um, so this is a way of you knowing where, when you give to the church, where does your money go? What kinds of work are you supporting? And so today we're going to focus on our uh, invitation and integration team, and Scott Pierce is going to talk to us about what that team does. Good morning. My name is Scott Pierce. I'm here representing the I and I team, or invitation and integration. Uh, I and I has two main goals, which you might have already guessed: invitation and integration. The inviting part of our mission means that we're actively inviting the greater Birmingham community to learn more about First Presbyterian and what we stand for. Uh, one way that we're doing this is by distributing posters. And I hope you've seen some of these around town. Uh, and in the narthex, there are more available for you. And I wanted to share a couple of short anecdotes about my experience uh, in, with these posters. Uh, a few months ago, I was in a small business in Southside, and I saw one of our posters hanging behind the counter of the, the business. And I commented on it, and I said, that, hey, that's, that's, that's my church. And uh, the woman uh, who owned the business uh, was, was standing there right behind the counter, and, and she, she kind of sheepishly said, yeah, I saw it uh, over at Good People Brewery, and I tore it down and brought it here. <laughs> okay, uh, we can get that replaced. Uh, but she enjoyed uh, and appreciated the message uh, so much that she felt like she had to also share it. Um, and that... That made, made, me, made me happy that, um, that people were sharing. The other is um, I hung one up in my apartment building. And uh, up until the last week or so, there had been a young couple living below me uh, who were LGBTQ. Um, and we'd kind of gotten onto nodding terms and some good mornings as we would pass each other uh, outside. And um, so I ran into them last week as they were moving out and did the whole, where are you headed, da, 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 all of that. And uh, one of them said, uh, were you the guy that hung the poster up? And I said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's me. And, and they said, thank you. It's nice to see the church has our back. And that, that was very touching for me. Um, these are two young people who felt ostracized and otherized. And so to have our beliefs and our faith and our message out in the community, I believe, is uh, very, very important for us to, to continue to do. Um, in the same vein, perhaps our biggest public invitation for First Presbyterian Church is our participation in the annual Central Alabama Pride Parade each June. Uh, this year, I believe it's June 8th. I think that's correct. Um, if you've not had the opportunity to participate in the parade, it is so much fun. It is a joyous, raucous celebration of the LGBTQ plus community and the Birmingham community as a whole. It is a radically inclusive event. All races, genders, origins, income levels are represented. Does that, does that sound familiar? Yeah? Um, last year, we were able to use Eric and Brandy Nix's truck and trailer and had a great time tossing out Skittles uh, and glow sticks. And I've had a number of folks uh, tell me how heartening and important it was for them to see a church participate in the parade. 
The second part of our INI mission is integration. In our terms, integration means we strive to meet folks where they are, whether it's when they come into the building or when we're out in the community. One thing we hear from those folks who join First Presbyterian is the warm welcome they received when they visited for worship. We're working on some pointers and guidelines for welcoming visitors as well as putting together a schedule of greeters to make sure that those who visit are welcomed. One thing you can do is to remember to wear your name tag. If you've lost it, let the office know. They'll get you another one. In addition to greeting visitors when they're here, my iPad just died in the middle of my sentence. Uh, in addition to greeting visitors when they're here, uh, Sherry Gill has been amazing at following up with any folks who signed the book with an email or note card. Thank you so much, Sherry, wherever you are. There you are. Uh, we're also working on ways to integrate our physical presence with the community around us. In the next few months, we plan to screen the Shuttlesworth documentary here in the building. It's an hour-long documentary on Reverend Shuttlesworth uh, and his leadership in the civil rights movement here in Birmingham. We want to invite our neighbors and other community groups to join us in watching this locally produced film, and we plan to have the producers here with us for discussion uh, dates to be announced. Um, we've also engaged a local uh, consulting firm, Choir Consulting, which is a uh, woman-owned local firm, to help us to understand better how we integrate in with our community and how these uh, new members who've come in learned about us, heard about us, felt about us as they were coming in so that we can better serve and integrate in with the community. And of course, we continue to have our monthly Theology on Tap social meets. This is a fun, low-key meetup, normally held at one of our many downtown breweries. It's also a great opportunity to invite a friend who might be curious about First Presbyterian. Theology on Tap normally meets on the last Thursday of each month uh, with a location announced via email the week prior. Uh, and note, this month, this Thursday, is Monday Thursday, so we'll be skipping uh, this month, but we'll be back in May. So there's lots going on with I&I. &I. And there we go. This is why I prefer paper. There we go. There's lots going on with I&I, and, I, and we're always looking for folks to lend a hand. If you can commit, if you can, can commit to joining the team, that's great. We'd love to have your hands. If you don't think you can join in that capacity, here's a few smaller commitments. Volunteer to walk or ride in this year's Pride Parade. Uh, it is scheduled for Saturday, June 8th, and it's always a great time. Uh, we decorate out, we do flags and glow sticks, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, we'll soon print another run of posters, and we'll have more in the narthex for you to take and hang where you think folks might appreciate them. Invite a friend along to Theology on Tap. Of course, that means that you should probably come too. Uh, if you're an extrovert like me, volunteer to be a greeter. If you're an introvert, volunteer to help Sherry with emails and note cards. And finally, wear your name tag. Uh, you want to know a secret? It even helps longer-term members who may have misplaced your name in their memory banks. So thank you. Thank you, Pierce. Um, I just want to reiterate the thing about Pride. I know Sherry has sent, is, is looking for people to help organize our Pride Parade presence. Um, Sherry, would you raise your hand, please? Um, if you're interested in helping with that, please just see her after church. I didn't tell her I was going to do that, but you're going to stick around, right, Sherry? So now, with grateful hearts for all the ways that God works in our lives, for all the ways God works through this church, for all the ways God works in the world, let us give our tithes and our offerings to our, to our God.
us pray. Holy One, as we sing our hosannas today, help us remember also the way that you are riding, where your face is headed, for suffering and rejection, pain and humiliation, and the cruel way of the cross. Let us also look forward to the joy of Easter Day, when you rise again from death to reign forever. Help us to use these gifts as evidence of that resurrection love that acknowledges you as Lord over all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now let's go forth to follow Jesus through this Holy Week, through the sorrow of Maundy Thursday, through the agony of Friday, and then on Sunday to Easter morning, because in following him, he is leading us to life abundant. Thanks be to God.